Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Andrea Caro. From a young age, she has battled poor body image issues and an eating disorder. Her personal healing journey has been guided by her faith, and she aims to support others in similar journeys as herself. So I'm happy to have Andrea here today and tell us a little bit about her story and what she's been through. So thank you so much, Andrea. Why don't you go ahead and tell the audience a little bit more about yourself? Yes. Thank you. First of all, Sarah, I want to thank you for having me on. This is this is great to be able to come on and be able to spread my message a little bit more in my story. But I am a, a mom. I have two daughters, a nine-year-old and a four-year-old. And I've been married for about four, almost 14 years now. And th- about three years ago, I realized that I kind of like, I realized how much I had lost myself in my younger years of, um, you know, like teenage years up through my young adult years. And I had this profound, just kind of aha moment, like I am a writer how did I lose? <laughs> and I, I just thought to myself, I am a writer. And how did I lose all of this? How did I lose my way? Um, and really, it's kind of, it's kind of all these things stacked onto itself. You had mentioned early on body image, and it really kind of started there. It started at the young age of eight, where I started to notice how different I was from my peers. And like most kids, I wanted to belong. I wanted to feel, I wanted to feel like my friends. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be seen. And I didn't like, I didn't like how I looked so different from everyone else. And so that kind of started in elementary school and I became very conscious of how much I weighed and I started to tie my value to my weight. I, I, I knew that I weighed more than most of my friends or all of my friends. And I thought that they were better than me because they were, they had, you know, they were smaller. They had a lower number on the scale. And as I entered in through middle school, I would have to say then it kind of snowballed into my anxiety and depression started forming around that. And it got to a point where I was sick and tired of feeling like I was the fat, like I was like the fat kid. I was sick and tired of, of not liking myself anymore. Um, And so when I was 14, I remember it was the summer, I started working out. I was like, that's it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to lose weight. And in three months, I lost 30 pounds. And I remember the first time I stepped on the scale, just I was just curious. I was just checking. And when I saw that I had dropped 10 pounds, it was like an an adrenaline hit for me. And, and it turned into this, how much more can I lose? I saw that I accomplished something and I became very obsessive about it. I had, I, I worked out every day. Um, and I started learning about food and, what and what foods had fat in them. And I started restricting foods that I thought had too much fat because my goal was to lose fat. 
And so this, and when I when and then, so that was the summer. And when I came back in my freshman year, I was, I was noticed. I was commended for losing weight. Like, it was like, how did you do this? Like a, a lot of my friends came up to me and how did you do that? I want to do that too. So it felt really great because it felt like I was doing this great thing. But at the same time, it was very complicated to know what was happening because I was an athlete. I always loved playing basketball. And so not only did I have the reward from from people saying, hey, good job for doing this, but it also helped me compete. I could and, and another thing, too, is I have asthma, so I could compete and I can compete better. It made it made that better. So there are all these things rolling into that. This is this is good. And at the same time, I kept trying to do more. Like, how much further can I take this? It, it was still like very obsessive, like about it. And it got worse and worse where I stopped eating lunch at school and I and that carried in that carried through all of high school. I would eat breakfast in the morning and I wouldn't eat lunch. And then right after school, I would go run like four miles. And this was something I I didn't it happened so gradual that I didn't even I wasn't really even aware. And I and back when I was a teenager, I would have never said I had an eating disorder. I I, I knew, I knew I was doing something that probably wasn't the best thing because I felt, I did feel like I was trying to hide, um, or I felt guilty if somebody would mention, Hey, aren't you hungry? Aren't you going to eat some lunch or are you okay? You know, that type of thing. And I, when I was 17, at this point in my eating disorder, I was very afraid of food and I was very restricting, like I said. And then my dad had a massive heart attack and I was there when it happened. So I experienced, I witnessed it firsthand. And then it went from, I went from fearing food to believing food was going to kill me. Like, okay, now when I eat food, it's going to clog my arteries and it would just put this extra pressure and anxiety on me even more. So I even restricted more. And then my senior year in high school, I met, I met my, my now husband. And that was the start of my healing. He, when I met him, I really believe that was the start of my healing. And I know God brought him into my life at that time for a reason because I was going to be going away to college and I did, but placing him in my life before going to college where, oh my gosh, I don't know how far I would have taken or how bad it could have gotten, you know, not having his influence on me. But once, once I met my now husband, I felt loved, you know, like not, I always felt love for my family and stuff, but I, for some reason, I needed that, 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 not that unconditional love, like from a parent, but I wanted, I wanted that love from somebody else. And for him loving me for who I was, that was the start. I know that was the start of it. And so our relationship went, I mean, that it was like five years and then we got married and then, to, and then about another five years, my first child was born. And I kind of had a moment after she was born when I realized how grateful I was for my body. Um, So having children really made me grateful because for one of the first times, I was mature enough to realize, oh my gosh, my body grew this little human being. And then I, I nursed both of my girls. It's like, oh, my body allowed me to sustain life, sustain their life for that much longer after. And I started thinking, 
wow, you know, I should give my, I should give my body a little more credit. And, and it just kind of took off from there, um, even more. And, and then starting to live in search for a purpose, it, I think it's kind of, this is what happens for most people. I mean, you go through these, these stages, everyone has like a similar journey. You go through these stages through, you know, you're, you're a kid and then you're a teen and then you're a young adult. And when I got into my thirties, I just felt more mature. And like, I've had these life experiences where I can reflect back, back on them. And I, with, with my faith, I always, I've always had a very close relationship with God. And I've always known that I was, I was created for a reason. Um, but those those early years of my eating disorder, I really got lost. So it's been a journey unraveling all those layers and getting back to who I am and who God created me to be and really stepping into my purpose. And I know one of my purposes outside of like, okay, I'm a mother. I have this purpose. I have, I'm blessed with these two beautiful girls to raise these girls and in really for them to step into who they are in their purpose and and and, and see their self-worth and their value in who they are created to be and i know there are so many people out there that have similar relationships with their bodies and food and they don't have the same support that i did and I want to be that support. Like I, I want to extend that first, you know, I've, I I know what it feels like. I've been in your shoes. I, I can help you through this type of thing. And so it's really that serving. I want to serve and help those because if I, I wish I would have been more aware when I was younger because it's really time wasted. It really is. That is one of my biggest regrets. I really feel like I wasted so much time being controlled by my eating disorder and doing what it was asking me to do rather than living my life. I wasn't living my life. So I want to live my life and I want to help others start living theirs. But that's a very long-winded answer. Um, But yeah. (laughs) You know, I'm curious, you've talked about, you know, being a mom, you know, how, how important that is to you. And now your oldest is, you know, around the age when you first started to experience these things. So kind of like two questions here. Uh, Are you now hyper aware, like being a mom and as your girls are growing up and like, were your parents aware of what you were going through as a younger kid and then how much you were restricting as you were losing this weight? Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting that you notice the, the same age because over the last, I would say last six, six, eight months, I've been dealing with triggers a lot and I was very upset right away and I couldn't pinpoint what it was. And then it dawned on me that my daughter, like you said, my oldest is the age of when this started affecting me. And I've been having to work through that quite a bit. And I've been, I've been kind of um, reading about triggers and exploring that for myself and working through those situations, like learning what process do I need to have set in place when I'm feeling triggered um, and how to regulate my emotions because I was blindsided by that. <laughs> I did not expect that to happen. And that's part of the journey, like the healing journey. When people talk about their journey, I don't think healing is linear. I think (laughs) there are things that will pop up and then it's a little reminder of, oh yeah, we need to address this yet. There's, there's a, there's this that you need to address. You need to work on some healing here because I, I really do believe, um, 
an eating disorder, like a lot of mental health conditions, they're just, it's a signal that you need healing and that your, your mind needs healing and that you need to listen to yourself and look inward. But then on the second part, you were saying with my parents, you know, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think it was something that was noticed or um, was a concern. I was never, I guess I was never uh, confronted by them or they never asked me. I was very good at hiding things. Like I, I was very good at internalizing pain and stuffing it and just kind of putting on, um, uh, you know, a false, a false image of how I really was. And because part of it too, is I felt like I was two different people. When I went to school, I was one type of Andrea. I was, I felt miserable and like really out of place. And like, I, I couldn't belong. And when was, when I was with my parents, I felt like myself. So I think when I was around them, I was naturally happier and kind of like relieved and like had kind of had the sense of like freedom and carefree because like I wasn't in school anymore trying to be somebody I wasn't. So I kind of let loose, you know, kind of carefree, like I said, around my parents. So it wouldn't, I think it'd be very hard for them to have picked up on, on things. Um, more than anything, probably they, if they would pick up on anything, it was probably maybe I was a little sad you know, just, but, but I don't, I don't think they ever, um, really want, I mean, I know like my, I have an older brother. I know there were times where he would get frustrated with me, like, cause we would be traveling and we'd be going through to get some food somewhere. And I, and I wouldn't get anything like if it was a drive through or something. And I remember one time he got really mad at me. He was like, you need to eat something. And I, I remember looking at him and saying, no, I don't like just, but so that was, but that was, it wasn't, nothing ever came of it. Nothing was like, why aren't you eating? Or at least I don't remember that. Like I, like I said, I was really good at inter- internalizing things and maybe just deflecting anything that they would be asking. And so then what changed when you met your now husband? How was he able to help you kind of find this pivot point to start the road to recovery. Yeah. Um, he, he listened. Um, he was someone that was pretty incredible because it's, it's like those, and that's why I know God brought him into my life at the time that I needed him the most because when I met Adam, like, it wasn't long that he knew me better than I knew myself. And, and whenever I would kind of just start sharing, because my anxiety would come out, come out in different ways. Like I would, like I said, I trusted him and I would start sharing. Like I would start talking about how, well, I can't eat this because of that, or, oh, I should really work out. Or I'd see a picture of myself when I was younger and I'd be like, oh, I got to try to look like that again. I need to lose some weight. And he would just listen. He would say like, why? And, and he would make little subtle comments. Um, like when I went, when I started college, I would only see, I actually, I went to college in a different town than the town I grew up in. So we actually only were dating for maybe three months. And then we entered a long distance relationship when I went to college. And so I'd see him on the weekends. And he, I remember one time he would, he commented about my cheeks looked a little, like a little sunk, like a little sunken in. And, and I could hear the concern in his voice, but he never, he was never like accusatory of anything or he never pressured. He was, like I said, he, he was there to listen. And one of the biggest things with my recovery, with, with, with him helping me was after we got married, almost every night before I could fall asleep, I would have to tell him the food I ate that day. 
Um, cause I feel so guilty. I had so much, I felt so much shame around the food I ate and, and I would, I would really be worried that it somehow was just going to transform into fat on my body. I don't know, but I could not fall asleep until I would ramble through the, the food I ate and he would lay there and listen. And when I'd be done, he would say, you're going to be okay. And that's what he would say to me. And I did that night after night after night and never once did he get upset with me. He never, cause I can, oh my gosh, I am not a very patient person. If I were in his shoes, I'd be like, didn't we just talk? You've, you've done, you've done this how many nights in a row now? Like get over it. Like, why do you keep saying this? This is ridiculous. He never said that. He would listen. And then at the end he would say, you're going to be okay. And then he would just, just, I mean, he's very, he's always very succinct. He'd never, he's not one to go on and on. So, and he's always very logical. And he would bring up the fact that, you know, this isn't, it's not possible for you to, if, if, if I was like feeling very anxious and like, what, I ate this extra thing, like this extra dessert, or we went to a buffet and he'd be very logical and just and just remind me that one time it's impossible for that one time to all of a sudden just you know derail you it's not it's it's one time and i know those evenings of saying what i would eat and then hearing afterwards that i'm going to be okay I know that was huge for me, especially it just it just was because he was willing to listen. And would you say that now you have a healthy relationship with food? Yes, it is. It is a lot better. It is. Um, I You hear a lot about like food neutrality, like you're not supposed to say any food is good or bad. I actually struggle with that because my personality makes this very challenging. I am a type one on the Enneagram. I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram or anything, but I'm very like black and white with things and, and like right and wrong. And so I have a, I, I struggle with food neutrality, but what I do very well with now is I don't use food as like a reward or, or like however much I exercise, like I don't restrict base on that. Um, I still have a hard time like with food neutrality. I don't know if that's something that I'll ever get to, but I know I don't use food in a way now where I've, well, I've earned this so I can eat it. Like if I want to eat it, I'll eat it. And um, that, cause that has been, uh, that's been something relatively new for me over the last year. Um, but yeah, cause I like restricting and using it as a reward. Like that is something that I don't do now. And earlier you mentioned that You would not have classified yourself as having an eating disorder when you were younger. So when did you make that realization that what you were doing was problematic? It probably wasn't until like, oh, it was in my later 20s because I I don't even know how I came across it. I think I started reading about anorexia for some reason. I remember reading on my phone and I was like, oh, my God, when I read about it, I was like, oh, my gosh, it's me. Like. I didn't, I didn't ever think of it that way. And I know there are a lot of people that they might not know or in it. There's just so much denial too. like, you don't, it's funny how your brain works. It's, it's like, if you can just deny that and not go there, then you don't have to address it because, because it, I know one of the reasons why I developed an eating disorder had to be the sense, the false sense of control that I had. Cause I felt like I didn't have very much control in my life. 
And it felt good to control something. And when you have to give that up, I think people cling, hold on to that. And so they'll want to deny it very, very strongly because they don't want to give up that control. And, it, and you can't, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of, like it's clouded. It's like, you don't even let yourself go there, or explore the idea of maybe I have an eating disorder or I ha have an unhealthy relationship with food. It just, it's like, it's just this thing that you need to control and you need it. Um, and you kind of, you kind of don't know who you are without it. Yeah, that makes sense. And so then has the body positivity, like, also improved along with the better sense of control and not so restrictive in eating. Yes, that that has gotten a lot better. And our our culture and our society and the messaging that we use and how and the things that we are telling these young girls what the beauty standard is it's very sad but it's it I think there are ways that it is getting better there are you can choose to follow social accounts you can choose to find those companies like Victoria's Secret and sometimes you'll see you know models that have a natural I mean like all different body types um because I know when I was growing up, I never saw anyone that had my body. You know, I never, like in a magazine, I, that was one, I remember pr being pretty young and thinking that that confirmed that I wasn't beautiful and that I wasn't, I wasn't right. Or I, that there was something like I was flawed in a way. Um, because I didn't have that body type and I didn't, I didn't know there were different body types. I didn't know that. And I didn't know like when I, when, when you go through your cycle, like when you, when your body starts changing and you start having your period, I didn't know that your body changes throughout the month. I didn't know those things either. And I really think if we, can educate the younger like the that and that's that's my goal is educating my daughters on that god made all these different body types and they're all important um <laughs> that's very that's it's it's very significant because i was oh my gosh it was probably like five or six years ago now i was in target so i was like around 30 <laughs> i was in target and i remember I saw this, this, oh, I, I saw this, um, this picture of this model that they had in the swimsuit section and I s couldn't believe it. I actually stopped and I just gawked at it because you could see her, you could see her stretch marks on her thighs and I could see some cellulite and she had like a body, like a, she had a womanly body and I had never seen that before. And so I always think Target's a good place to go if you want it because they will actually show different models in the store but that was one that was like the first time I saw someone that looked like me like I felt like like that could have been me that was the first time I saw someone being displayed as look at she's she's beautiful and she's wearing this bikini and she's she's just wonderful and it it was it took, it just took me by surprise. Like I said, I just stopped and I just stared at her for a little while. I felt kind of foolish, but I, it meant it really struck a chord in me seeing that. But I, I don't even know what your question was now. I just started rambling about, <laughs> but so like seeing stuff, seeing images like that and following other accounts and in learning how in just starting to appreciate my body for all the things and being able to reflect back on everything my body has done for me and all the 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 hard things it has been through and we're still going i 
I'm like I said, I'm at a place where there's just more of this gratitude. So I'm, I feel very appreciative of my body and I'm not, I'm not trying to change it. Like I'm not looking at it going, you know what? I don't like that. Um, we're going to change that. We're going to work really hard on changing that. Um, and one thing I started doing too with the body image is, is the positive affirmations. So that is one thing that is super critical is really capturing those negative thoughts. I didn't know how negative I was and how much I was putting myself down continually. Like if I'd walk in front of a mirror, it was never positive. It was like, oh my gosh, okay, now we got to do this. And a while ago, whenever I would feel that, when I would feel that negative um, like criticism come up, I would stop myself and say, nope, we don't do that anymore. God created you to this, this way. God made you this way. And how dare you doubt the creator? Like you think you could have, you think he made a mistake? Like, <laughs> and so that really, that was one thing that really helped was just that body positivity. Like, yeah, I was made this way and like owning it, like stepping into it. Like, yeah, I'm supposed to be this way. Now, before you got to that point of like the positive affirmations, did you ever waver in your faith when the anxiety and the depression and all of these things were happening that you weren't where you needed to be? Did you waver in the faith at all? I, I didn't, but I never brought, I had faith in other things. Like I never brought God into that part of my life. Do you know what I mean? Like I never allowed it to enter. And, and I think part of it is that, is that control again in depression, really? Like I was through college and I've, I've been, I'm very susceptible to depression and I have battled it over the years. And, um, we have to invite God into our healing we have to invite him to help us and until i did that um i just kind of kept that separate i never i i kind of when i was a kid i kind of remember thinking that maybe he loved other children more because because he made them thin like i remember thinking that that maybe i wasn't as important because, or he didn't love me as much because, um, because I wasn't, I didn't have a fast metabolism, like all my friends, but I, I've never really felt like my, that's a hard one because yeah, the relationship there were a number of times where I wouldn't talk to God. Um, and that's, that's kind of how, that's kind of how I gauge how well he, my relationship is going. If I am reaching out and talking, I have like, it's like a conversational type of relationship, very casual, like, I like, a, like a friend, like you would talk to a friend and, and I know that there were years that in times when I probably, I was snubbing him and, and, and avoiding him. Um, but I always knew he was there, but I wasn't ready to talk to him. But yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate you answering that question and kind of thinking it out um, because your faith is so important in the journey. Now you've mentioned how, you know, you want to help your girls, you want to help other people, you know, not go through the things that you went through. So what are you doing as a parent and otherwise to spread that message and make sure, you know, you, you kind of said how you were good at hiding things and making, you know, your problems not as open. What are you, what are your hopes for your girls and what are you doing to spread that message? Yeah, I, there are probably 
well, there's a number of things, but I want to be emotionally available for my daughters um, so that they feel like they can come to me and talk to me about the hard things. And it really, it really comes down to being emotionally available for the not hard things, because if your kids can come to you and you're available just to hear them out and listen, you're teaching them that you're, you're a safe, you're, you're safe and you're trustworthy and that they can bring those emotions to you. And, and it's been working pretty well so far because, um, my nine-year-old, she is very intense and very passionate and she has a, a lot of, of deep thoughts and feelings. And she's, we've definitely had a number of conversations over the, the last, the last years. And the main thing that I'm going to be focusing on is, like I said earlier, about educating them about there's actually different body types. And because the messaging is still, it's still the same um, with, with the beauty standard. Like it's still so much the same. And I want them to have that foundation, that mindset and that knowledge that God created them. He made them and God doesn't make mistakes. So he did not make a mistake in the way he created them. So I'm teaching the tools that I learned for myself. Now that I have a good grasp on them and I can, and I can kind of enact and, you know, initiate them when I need them. I am starting to teach them to my, to my nine-year-old and, um, I have not yet had a, had a conversation with her yet. It's very soon. I'm going to tell her a little bit about my personal story um, just so she's aware. And and I want to start educating her and, and my four-year-old about the different body types. And um, yeah, and it's, it's pretty challenging. I have to be very aware of the words I am using. Like I have to be aware of my, my habits around food and what I am saying about food when they are around and when they are making food choices. I have to be very sensitive about how I teach healthy food habits versus coming at it at a way of like shaming um, and kind of like, well, don't you think that's enough ranch dressing? You know, like you, I have to be, I have to be aware of how I am teaching them to look at food. Um, and it, it's a learning, it, it's a learning curve for sure, but I've, I have learned a lot and um, it's, it's going pretty good. It's going pretty good. It's my nine-year-old's pretty confident and she's got a lot going for her. So, so does my four-year-old, but, um, I know that the nine-year-olds at that age where people are starting to talk at school, you know, they're at that, she's a third grader. So there is, there is that talk starting about the way people look and, so that conversation needs to get going. And um, it's, it's, it, it's really, it's really hard um, because I get triggered so much of, around that. And it's something that's very new for me. And I've been having to work through a lot of things with that. It's, but it's, it's we're we're doing good with it and it's and it's just teaching them that they have a purpose and their value and their self-worth is not tied to their to their physical self their identity is their soul and that 
our our body is our vehicle for our soul and to to carry out our purpose we have to take care of the the vehicle the body so the soul can do its carry out its purpose that is kind of the angle i come i i i use to approach and it seems to be working so far pretty good <laughs> I was happy the other day because I asked my nine-year-old, I said, I asked her, why, why does mom work out? Why do, why do I work out? And she's like, so you have a healthy mind and a healthy body. So I'm, I'm glad I asked her that question because I could gauge kind of where she was at with it or uh, wh- how she's perceiving it, right? Because that's the main thing is how we perceive the information that's floating around us everywhere. So I like her perceptions. Her perceptions are going well. Yes, it sounds like it. You know, it's not the, you know, when you were at that age, the desire to work out to just lose weight, like that was kind of the one, the one mindset. And the fact that you're aware of, you know, the triggers that you're experiencing and knowing like what's to come as as your girls get older, you know, keeping that realistic part of it. Um, and knowing that your husband's there as well. And he was, you know, your support system to that, not the age they're at now, but later on, um, I'm sure that I would assume that he will also be part of that. Um, those conversations for them. I, yeah, because here's the thing I had said this, I don't know if I was talking to my mom or maybe it was Adam, my husband, I was saying there needs to be more, there need to be more men involved in this conversation. So I would think for my daughters to have their dad step in and kind of declare their worth and their beauty. I think that he can definitely supply that. Yeah, definitely. Now, do you want to share a little bit about what you're doing, um, in terms of helping others outside of your family um, and kind of the additional messaging you're putting out to the world? Yes. I, I have a podcast called Good Vanilla. And on there, I teach the tools and like the mindset shifts that I have done in my own healing journey. And I have an Instagram page as well where I'm this, I'm very at the infancy of starting a business where I help other women and empower them to heal their relationships with their body and with food. And, it, and really, I am coming, I really want to focus on the faith mindset of it, that wellness should be, we should pursue wellness from a faith foundation. Because for me, like that is my my faith is my foundation is in everything and i don't i wouldn't be anywhere without it and i really believe god should be in in our healing um but i am just starting to teach on instagram and and releasing my podcast episodes where i go really deep in teaching on like i said the tools and the mindset sh- mindset shifts and one aspect that I think is very important is is I I don't think to heal we have to stop like working out or we have to like view exercise as like this evil thing. Um, I've always liked I've always liked doing like hard workouts and challenging myself that way because I'm a very intense person and. I, I like challenging myself in that way in, and I'm going to, and I'd like to talk about how to shift that mindset around exercise or working out, how you don't have to, how you don't have to lose that to heal. And I've over the last so many years, I've done a lot of internal work on evaluating how I approach exercise and the why behind it, essentially, um, because that's something that is a non-negotiable for me. I mean, even, I mean, having being so susceptible to depression and anxiety, 
I can feel the benefits of exercise in my brain and just on my nerves. And um, I feel like sometimes it's kind of looked at in a negative way, like when you're healing and that you can't, you can't, um, or it's almost like people say that maybe you're not healed if you're still exercising or working out and, um, but it's, it's just something I like to do. But since I have like an obsessive personality, I can take things too far. So I just, it's just being very mindfully aware of why I am choosing to do it and, and, and walking myself through that and actually like journaling through it and, and not doing it because I think I should, but because I want to. And letting myself, like stopping and asking myself and checking in with my body and saying, okay, do you want to do this? Or what would feel good right now? What what type of movement, movement would feel good for your body? And making it from that choice rather than like a punishing type of, ty- type of mindset. Yes, the why is so important when it comes to those things. Now, before I start to wrap things up, is there anything else you would like to share with the listeners today? Um, the main thing is so often with eating disorders and other, kind of like what I said right away about how we get lost. I really believe that any mental health condition, like an eating disorder is a signal. It's like a cry for help. It's like something is not aligned inside. And, and it's, it's a signal for us to stop and look inward and that can be really hard to do, but it's the work that has to be done. It's, it's kind of like you have to be a detective and figure out almost why, why things are, why you are struggling where you are struggling. Um, and that there's always going to be support out there. You don't have to feel alone um, because it's, it's amazing the number of people that once I've started talking about my journey that have said that either their sister has an eating disorder or it seems like everyone I talk to, like they know somebody that either does or did. And it's something I think there's a lot of bad stigma around and people don't want to admit that they need help and they want to just kind of hide behind it and it really wasn't until I started like those many years ago my anxiety I literally couldn't hold it in anymore and I started speaking it out and I had someone my husband who loved and cared for me listen and was just gentle and until people can start speaking that out I really think you stay stuck so it's it's really finding someone you trust um and and just start talking about it I think that was actually the it's my second podcast episode. I think I actually it was titled why you need to start talking about your eating disorder ASAP. Cause I, I know it was that significant. Like it was that, it was that much of a needle mover in my healing. It's, it's hard. You got to be brave and you got to have the courage to do it, but you're going to find somebody that cares, somebody that wants to help someone that will, will be there to hold your hand. And and there's hope like so it just it just breaks my heart when people think that they have to stay stuck or that they have the this thought that well how is it going to get any better it's just very hopeless and i want people to know that there is hope and that anyone can heal anyone can heal because i i just keep going back to the Bible verse that, you know, with, through, with God, all things are possible. 
And I, I believe that it, he can work miracles and, and it was not, it's not, your purpose is not to be stuck in a mental health condition, like an eating disorder or, or struggling. Your purpose is something else. And it's some, you have a lot of self-worth and a lot of value and with healing and realigning with your identity, that is really where, that's really where the healing comes and it stays and people can get there. They can. Yes. Now at the end of all my episodes, I do ask my guests a random question. So my question for you today is what celebrity do you most identify with? Oh my gosh. What celebrity do I most identify with? Hmm. Let's see. I'm trying to think of probably. Mm, I I'd have to say right now it would probably like be like Mila Kunis because I saw an I saw an interview. She was on Kelly Clarkson's show, and she was talking about um just being a mom and about like <laughs> be like just being on like not wanting to be on social media and she just is very down to earth and fun and it just seems like someone that you when you sit down to talk to her it's, she, she feels like someone that you have known for a while and um and yeah i I, I feel I feel like I identify a lot with her. It's a lot of people that when I meet them, they they say I'm approachable and I'm easy to talk to and 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 I think she's pretty cool. <laughs> so. All right, that brings this episode to a close. I'll be leaving a link tree link for Andrea in the description. I'll bring you to her website, her podcast. She also has a free workbook. If you'd be interested in looking to what she offers there, feel free to go check any of those links out within the link tree. And of course, if you'd like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description as well. It brings you to all of our past episodes, all past resources and social media for past guests, along with our social media, including Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily through a one-time donation or a recurring donation, a link to do that is in the description as well. And of course, my email is also there if you would like to reach out to me and be a guest on the show. I'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much, Andrea, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Sarah.